Oopsie. Hi, I can see a few connected there. I think there's a chat if you guys want to ask any questions. We're going to comment soon. We're just waiting for, for a few more people to connect again. All right, we're going to start. I can see people connected, so we're going to start now. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me. My name is Claudia. I'm one of the physiotherapists at Wellness Embodied in Kent. I have a special interest um, in treating patients that suffer from headaches, um, neck pain, dizziness, vertigo, and I think all that is part of the concussion patients as well. So this year we have decided with the other physios to get our clinic certified as a complete concussion management clinic. So it's that's a large community all over the world. And we are the only ones in Kent at the moment, so that's very exciting. We're looking forward to increase the network with schools and clubs so we can find the best approach and management for patients after head concussion. Um, so I'm going to start sharing. Can everyone see that? Is that right? I'm sharing the screen. Just give me a second. There we go. That's it. All right, let's get started. Can everyone hear me? All right, so yes, this is a the perfect. I can see everyone. This is complete concussion management together with wellness embodied. And today we're gonna go through acute concussion management. So, just give me a second. Perfect. So, there is obviously a large problem with the concussion in sports. Um, prevalence estimates that across most of studies, there's been between a 10 and 30 percent of athletes involved in sports um, that suffer concussion each season. So, that's a very high 
number for this type of injury. Um, and the big problem is that 50% of those concussions in sport are not actually reported. And that's the big problem. Um, many, many times, most of the times, those uh, concussions are not reported because they're not even recognized as a concussion. Maybe the patient doesn't think that they had a concussion. Maybe the parents of that patient thinks, oh, he's all right, he should be fine. Even us as health professionals, sort of ignore and that's mainly because of lack of information and education and of this network that we're trying to build. Um, concussions can cause uh, a long-term brain damage as well as even very severe consequences in our brain. Um, we will see throughout this presentation most of the, these negative effects are completely preventable um, and if the injuries are dealt with um, the correct management, they can definitely uh, be treated. And we, if we all work together, we can definitely prevent this from happening. Um, so as I was, oh, sorry, as I was saying before, the most important and the first step for a concussion management is to recognize it as a concussion. So that's our job as health professionals, but also jobs is the job of the teachers or coaches or whoever is in charge of the person that is having the concussion. So a concussion um, is a type of brain injury. We call it mild brain injury. We get a, a severe brain injury when the patient can be in coma. Um, so we as health professional can use different scales to find out in which stage our patient is. Uh, we have the Glasgow Coma Scale, we have the post-traumatic traumatic amnesia because that's a very common symptom after concussion. Patients are a bit confused, a bit lost, um, and also a loss of consciousness. Doesn't mean that if you didn't have a loss of consciousness during a concussion, you didn't suffer a concussion. As it says here, a mild brain injury says loss of consciousness, zero, to 30 minutes. So you might have no loss of consciousness at all, but you still concuss. So we are going to be working with these type of patients, the ones that have a mild concussion. Moderate and severe is different type, all right? So my brain injury and concussion are synonymous. So before um, we talk about the solution and the treatment for um, the concussion, we need to understand a bit more what a concussion is. At the beginning, they used to say that um, a concussion was when we, our brain, we hit our head and we had a damage in the area that we hit the head and another like injury in the back of the area because it was like a bouncing effect on your brain. But what we now understand thanks to science is that actually because our brain is floating in our skull, every time we have a concussion, our head gets shaking quite hard. And I'm saying this because sometimes patients don't even need to hit the head to suffer concussion. If they have a very bad and strong neck injury, like a whiplash, that brain is going to be bouncing back and forth and it's going to create enough damage to produce concussion symptoms. So here, I show you a video. That's actually what happens, and that's just an impact with our hand, looking at that video. So that's what is happening in our brain. So a mild brain injury, a concussion, is um, recognized as a functional damage of the brain. There isn't such a thing as bleeding. So if you do MRI, if you do CT scan after concussion, and they diagnose you as a mild, brain injury it means that there is no bleeding, there is no structural damage in the brain. But however, because of that bouncing back and forth and everywhere, we are creating uh, or stretching the nerve cells and that's going to cause them to fire. So that basically is tricking the nerves into the thinking that um, has received a signal. So that nerve firing is the normal process that we usually have. So if I want to speak to move my hands, there is a network I'm firing between different cells of our brain. But after concussion, this firing is way 
aggravated. It's generally too much for the brain to handle because every single cell of the brain is getting, is firing, it's getting excited. So this is usually too much for the brain to cope. And that's why we feel so fatigued, so tired, so confused. We sometimes even look, can lose the consciousness because it's just way too much for that brain to cope. So that's the main thing and very important to understand. We will probably wear in a soccer field and the kid has a head concussion and they say, oh, he didn't lose the consciousness. You take it to the ED department and the or emergency department and they say, oh, there is no bleeding. The C MRI is fine. The CT scan is fine. It's, off, it's good to go. That's actually a mistake because probably there is any damage, structural damage. But if we see that patient having a concussion, there is no doubt that he had a concussion. You see it happening. You know that the kid hit the head. And we know that when it's a concussion, we won't find blood. We will find these functional changes in the brain. Yeah. So the injury um, has two phases. One is an excitation phase that lasts between seconds to hours and doing that that's the period where everything is fired so the brain is trying to cope there is a lot of um, energy consumption then so then because we have used so much energy the brain goes into a depression stage when it's very tired very fatigued and really needs to slowly start building up that energy that just wasted um, so the symptoms after concussion will generally go rather quickly, but it's important uh, that the athlete remains out of the game because during the concussion, we are only on the first uh, phase um, that only lasts seconds to hours. The second phase is, um, comes after the initial first seconds to hours and that's the most dangerous phase because as we said there's a deficit of energy so that brain can't cope with anything anymore so a second injury will be would mean sometimes the, the death of that person so it's very very important if we see someone having a concussion take them off the field as soon as they're ready to be taken obviously sometimes we need to take preventions, uh, we need to call the ambulance, we need to have qualified people to remove that person from the, the field if he's unconscious. But if the person is conscious, can, can feel the, the, the neck is all right, the fingers, they can feel everything, they're just a bit woozy or funny, just remove them to, of the field and let them sit down and they are not allowed to go back to uh, play. Because if they have a second injury, in that depression stage, it could be very, very bad. Having permanent damage or sometimes can cause the death. All right. So this is what we were just saying about the energy levels. Um, the ATP is a unit of energy we talk in our body. So on your, this is showing the recovery process on your brain. On your Y axis, we have the ATP, and on the X axis, we have the time. So this study has been done in animals. So this is where the animal is normal with a concussion. As soon as I suffer a concussion, the energy level starts dropping, dropping, dropping. Six hours is the lowest it gets, and within five days, it's slowly getting back to normal. Um, this period where the energy is the lowest is called the vulnerable period. So this is when a second injury could be very, very bad for that brain. Um, as I said before, this is a graphic based on an animal. Our, the animals and our brain function pretty similar, but unfortunately for humans, this period is way longer. So instead of having the depression, in six hours, our brain, um, in humans, we have the peak low at five days after the injury. So that is when we have to be super careful. Patients shouldn't even go training or do any contact um, sports or any risk activities that can produce another injury. Because again, the energy level in the brain is super low 
and any minimal uh, injury can cause permanent damage. So for us, for humans to fully recover, we are talking about two to four weeks. So that's just a long period of time. And probably if you have kids or if you ever suffer a concussion or you know someone that's suffering, probably we are back to normal, back to training the following day or even the same day. So this is what we want to create awareness that it's not that easy and it's very dangerous to do things when the brain is not ready. Um, all right. So this is what happens if we get the return to sport too soon. Um, so this is why we shouldn't go back to, to sport too soon. So we have another graph with energy levels here and the time at the bottom. The first blue line indicates normal health brain levels. And then when you receive a concussion, your brain energy level drops probably to the 80%. And then that takes two to four weeks to go back to normal brain energy levels. That's what I was just planning before. But pro, let's say that you are allowed here. Let's say that instead of allowing two to four weeks to go back uh, and give the brain the period to recover, you suffer a second concussion here in between those two, two to four weeks. Look at different how the energy level drops immediately and it goes under 60%, pretty much it's nearly 40%. And look how much the period of recovery has extended now. So, if it happens that even after a second concussion, you get a third concussion, the energy levels are even lower and the period of time, it might never, so it might never happen that you go back to normal brain energy levels. So now we're talking about a permanent brain damage. We know that if the, our brain is, gets under 60% of the energy level, we start losing some cells of that brain. So that means the cells that died, they cannot be recovered. So that can happen anyway. It can be the, the cells that control your speech, the cells that control your arm movements, the cells that control the way you sleep, whatever. We don't know where is it going to happen, but we know it's going to be cell damage. And once that happens, it's completely gone and there is no way to recover it. So look how important it is to prevent and choose to respect for weeks to make sure that we go back to normal brain energy levels and to avoid a second injury. All right. So, how can we tell or how do we determine if there's a, a how to recover that brain? So, as I said before, when we have a concussion, oops. Um, my uh, migraine injury is very hard to uh, find that on a so it's impossible but you can't find it on mri or ct scan because there isn't such a thing as a structural damage there's no bleeding it's a functional damage so ideally in the ideal world and that's what we're trying to create this network with coaches and schools and clubs is to have a pre-injury baseline test so what does it mean Precision, how the, the kids or athletes are getting ready to go to full-time training. That's the same thing will be this. We need to get, it will be perfect if we could get a health professionals, a pre-injury baseline test. That means pre-test each person to see how they are, what levels of cognitive level, memory, coordination, balance, strength. So how is that? athlete functioning before any injury so then if they have an injury we can compare we can say okay you were like this before you have this injury and now like you are here so you are not as good as you used to be so that means you need to continue rehab you need to continue training you're not ready to go back to fully training or contact sports because your brain hasn't healed so that's what we are looking for. We're looking to try to get that pre-injury baseline test on each person 
So then we can compare before and after to make the best decision as health professionals to get that patient the clearance to go back to the sport. Um, there are a lot of tests that these days are being used, like sideline tests, like SCAT-5 or impact test. SCAT-5 is the more popular one for sidelines. So those tests are okay for sideline and remove the player from the field, but doesn't mean that if the patient doesn't have, so SCAT-5 only assess cognitive stuff, doesn't assess much of the balance, and it's not that reliable either. Why is this? Because they have found that SCAT-5 is only reliable three days, up to three days after injury. So let's say the patient has the injury on Sunday, on Wednesday, on Thursday, come to see me. I can't rely on that SCAT-5 anymore. I know that results that we get from SCAT-5 are not accurate because that's how that test works. So we actually need to have that, those objective measures of tests. So we can test the function. So we need to test the balance, the coordination, the strength. Um, and all this um, can be done very easily. It's just a matter of organizing the clubs, organizing the teams, organizing the schools. So each patient has its own test. And then if something happens, we can make better decisions to let them go back to, to play. It's very important to do, the more tests we do, the more comprehensive that management is going to be. We cannot really rely on one symptom and one test. We need to do as much as we can because, again, we are talking about permanent brain damage. We, can't, we need to take it seriously. So can a concussion be treated? Definitely, yes. Um, how do we treat it? Well, these are all the options we have. So back in the day, they used to say, oh, you have a concussion, you need to rest for X, X, and Y days. Now we don't want that to happen. So if you bring your child to, or athlete to a GP, they will likely give you them and not telling not to have activities, go for two weeks, sit at home and rest. However, research now shows that the rest is not the best. And actually, the more you rest, sometimes can get worse because you're delaying the recovery. So, and sometimes those symptoms, if we delay the recovery, can even get chronic. So, what can we do? As I said, when every time we have a head concussion, our neck follows the head. So, when your head impacts into something, your neck is going to suffer what we call whiplash. That is that acceleration, deceleration movement of your neck that we usually know and that people can suffer in car accidents. So as physios, we can treat that neck. We can recover the strength and the normal movement. Some patients can get dizziness or symptoms like headaches after concussion, and that can be coming from your neck. We also do test uh, what we call stress test. So patients are on a treadmill, uh, walking, and we do it monitoring the heart rate and the symptoms. We need, so when we have a concussion, we need to say that the energy levels are very low. So how do we recover those energy levels? We need to get blood flowing around the brain. But sometimes if we push ourselves too hard and that heart rate is too high, the symptoms can get worse. So how do we do to find the right blood level and um, heart rate level without worsening the symptoms? That's when we do this treadmill test. We are monitoring the patient increasing slowly each minute, the intensity, and assessing the symptoms. Once the patient reaches a heart rate that uh, can cause symptoms, we say, okay, this is your maximal heart rate at the moment. We kind of go there, we're going to go lower, and we teach them and guide them to exercise because we want them to exercise. We want that, that ongoing everywhere, but on safe levels. So that's something we, can, we are qualified to do. We also can guide them through a diet, anti-inflammatory di uh, brain di diet. We say the, one of the causes of symptoms after concussion is um, could be related to inflammation in those cells after 
that excitatory phase. So the diet, they have found that avoiding things like sugar or gluten, and it's more complex than that, but basically trying to follow a specific diet for brain recovery can help to reduce the symptoms and to speed up the recovery. Then other patients, so my brain injury has so many, so many symptoms is because we said each or every way in the brain can be damaged. So some patients can have dizziness or vertigo or problems with the balance and coordination. And that's why we as physiotherapists can do vestibular therapy. We treat these patients a lot. I particularly do that here. Um, so we, a lot of, we are training the brain to be able to move without causing sickness, without causing dizziness. We're trying to get that balance good at ASAP, and sometimes patients can have coordination issues, so all that is addressed, assessed, and treated. And some other patients also describe symptoms like blur, uh, blur vision, or sometimes they can read and focus their eyes, or they get dizzy when they scroll the computer, so all that can get fixed. And it's very important to understand that a concussion shouldn't get into a long-term injury. If we know how to manage it and if we know what to do, those symptoms shouldn't prolong. Sometimes, however, because those patients uh, are delayed into see a health professional qualified for concussion or because um, the, um, the body has had, uh, is reacting differently, those symptoms can get prolonged. So after four weeks, the patient keeps complaining about headaches, fatigue, problems sleeping, irritability, changes in, in the mood, um, headaches, nauseous, vertigo. If they keep complaining about those things, sometimes people say, I'm not back to normal. I don't know what's going on with me. All those are signs that the patients see ongoing with the inflammatory process. And that's if it's after 30 days, we call the patient is under a past concussion syndrome. So it's exactly the same like an acute concussion but just lasting longer. So how do we prevent these patients from getting uh, symptoms prolonged? With education, with assessment, with right management. That's what we hear, that's what we're talking today, to recognize these concussions, set them straight away to health professional, and they need to get the appropriate management, including neck treatment, diet, visual therapy, vestibular therapy. If we get all that sorted, there shouldn't be such a thing as past concussion syndrome in most cases. All right, so once we receive the patient, what do we do? We go through stages. We say, okay, yeah, do you suffer a concussion? You, we have to do this diet, this therapy, blah, blah, blah. And then we need to reintroduce them to normal activities. So this is our return to learn or work, or return to learn or work or and play our map, yeah? So, um, initially we have the symptom, the first stage of this is the symptom limited rest. That's usually in the first 24 to 48 hours after concussion. Do we, we say we are not resting, fully resting, we're just doing activities as we can tolerate. What does it mean? Back in the days, they used to tell us you have to rest, no light, no phone, don't talk to anyone, don't drink coffee, La, 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 la. Now we know that if we rest too much, can get things worse, can delay the recovery. So what do we do? We tell the patients, okay, you can do your activities at home, but as soon as something is increasing your symptoms, you need to stop and not do it again. Wait 24 hours and try to do that again. For example, you can tell them, you can watch TV, try watch TV 10 minutes. If after 10 minutes you feel exhausted, your symptoms increase, you need to go to sleep for five hours, probably don't, don't watch TV for one day and try to watch 10 minutes again after 24 hours. So we want them to be actively resting. If after 24 and 48 hours, patient is managing okay, we want to start increasing that activity. Is what we call like cognitive activity. We tell them to start Maybe if they have homework, to see if they can do 20 minutes of the homework, half an hour, 
or they can read a book or they can do some memory tests or playing with memory cards or some things from work. It has to be light and always respecting the symptoms. We don't want them to increase uh, and make things worse. If everything goes all right after that stage, they are allowed to go to half day of school or work. And usually this uh, has restrictions. So most of the time kids um, have to have their own breaks if they are at school. They probably, um, they, we don't, we, they can't go for an assessment or if you are at work, probably avoid meetings, avoid, uh, be allowed to take your own breaks in case you need it. But if after half day of school or work, your symptoms are good, 24 hours later, you're allowed to do a full day of school or work with the same limitations. Breaks, no tests, uh, no meetings, try to avoid stressful situations, but we are trying to reintroduce you as, much, as soon as possible. And then, um, so this is something important for teachers or parents or whoever lives with a patient, pa person that has a concussion. Um, if after five days when they are supposed to go back to return to work or return to school, they still feel a lot of symptoms, um, that's when you guys probably need to say, okay, definitely you need some therapy in case you haven't brought them to the health professional before. So we can start with all the next treatment and the vestibular uh, rehabilitation because usually you were, normal, you were normal to be at work and doing full duties and since you had a concussion, something's still happening there. So that's a question mark for everyone. If my kid had a concussion on the weekend, and on Fridays, still complaining about symptoms, and he's called, they're calling me from school because he can't concentrate or he's complaining. Definitely, definitely need to be assessed because something is happening. All right. So, the stage five of this map is um, return to play. Um, so, we're trying if if they are active or athletes that do sports, we're trying to get them back to that sport as soon as possible, but always with the right um, measures. So here at the clinic, we do that uh, stress test or treadmill test that is called the following the Buffalo protocol. So we do like physical activity, we monitor the heart rate, and we see if any um, symptom exacerbation. If the patient passes that test without symptom exacerbations, uh, they are fine to go back to full academic activities, um, but they're still not allowed to do any contact activities or the gym is, is still, should be still held for a while. Uh, if they pass this stage, they can go back to stage six, that is, uh, start doing some drills from, for the sport they do. So if they don't do any sports, they are pretty much um, clear up after this. But most of the times patients do sports, that's why they have a concussion. So they are very, very keen and the only thing they want to know is when they're allowed to go back to work and uh, to play. So this is when we have to be working as a team with the coaches and everyone that is involved or lives with that patient. Um, if they pass the treadmill test with exacerbating symptoms means that the heart is not involved and the blood flow is normal. So that means um, the dizziness or symptoms might be coming from the neck or from other part of the brain. So patients are allowed to go back to sport specific activities um, where they're gonna be doing some drills, jogging around the field, uh, they're not allowed to be in contact with anyone, not even from their own team. And this is very important for the coach or the trainer to be in contact with us as health professionals and they can do it through an app that I will be talking about it. Uh, saying, okay, that this patient came today for first uh, practice. It was non-contact, sport specific, respond well, symptoms didn't, didn't worse, worsen. So if that happens, we are good to move to stage seven. If the patient is still having symptoms while doing those activities, we need to stay at that stage. 
they are not they are not allowed to move forward. So this complete concussion management is an app that coaches and athletes and we health professionals have. We can all be sharing information, sharing the correct the athlete can tell me the symptoms so I can read it from the computer without even having to have them to come to see me. I can see how they're going. I can see what the coach is saying, how all the parents are saying. And they also give you like good ideas about type of drills to do. So it's very, very handy. And we're working together to get that patient back to normal. So as I say, if the symptoms don't increase, we are allowed to move towards stage seven where they are no conjunct training drills and um, it's still um, it's more specific, more intense than the stage before. The coach and trainer still should be communicating the athlete progress through the app. Um, and they, if they are high performance athletes and they pass this stage, they, the no content training drills, they should go back to the clinic with us and we do a very high chance specific test for athletes to make sure they are fully recovered to go back to contact sports. So this is a physical exertion test I was just talking about. It's very high performance. So we won't do them for probably kids that are playing AFL like casual. But we have to do it for high elite athletes, definitely, because this is assessing everything, the reaction time, the strength, coordination, lower and upper limb and ability, everything. So if they pass this test without any symptoms activation, they're definitely ready to go back to contact sport, um, and normal practice. So if in a stage B, A, B, if they pass the physical exertion test with no symptoms, um, they can do all the other uh, tests for cognitive and memory. And then they can go to full contact practice before playing the game. So everyone has to have like a specific training phase and then non-contact full training practice and then contact practice and then after the entire contact practice session, they can go back to the game. So this is the app I was talking about before. Um, so and complete concussion management, that is a qualification and certification we have in the clinic. It also provides a course or sideline for parents or coaches or teachers. So it's, I think it's um, one hour, six model online training. You get a certificate after competition, uh, comp uh, doing it. Um, you can use the app that I was talking about. And that, this way we start being com in communication. So that means you guys can access to all the information and if any of the uh, your athletes, if you're a coach, um, are injured, we can, you can give me the information and I can immediately access to that. So we can follow that very closely. Um, so this is the idea of it. Like as teachers and coaches, you get the silent course and then you get the application and then you get all the athletes information there. And ideally, in an ideal world, we should all be connected. So you guys will have the app and the sideline side course, and then the athlete will have the baseline test. So we can compare before and after injury, and everyone will be connected to us as health professionals through the app. So this way we are in contact, constant contact, and. So, uh, we as a professional can tell you, okay, you're ready to move on to stage seven, let, let your coach know that you can do this and that, but you shouldn't do this. And then we talk, we, uh, talk to the coach, uh, coach and say, look, he has done well on stage six, so I think he's ready to go to step seven. We check what the patient said, and was like, yeah, you're right, the patient hasn't had any increased uh, uh, worsening of the symptoms. So yeah, they're ready to next stage. So it's like constant updating and communication 
that's what we're looking for. The only way, as we said, of preventing, so a concussion cannot be prevented, what it can be prevented is a second injury and worsening of the symptoms, or the symptoms for lasting too long. So unfortunately, most of the sports, uh, they have tried to reduce the concussion incidence, but they haven't had any luck. Some of them, yeah, they have to use helmets and things like that, but they are accidents, so it's hard to prevent, but we can prevent further damage or chronic symptoms, and that's with the correct management. So now you guys know that as soon as someone has suffered a concussion, you can see it, you need to pay attention to the symptoms, um, if there are serious symptoms like vomiting, nausea, loss of consciousness, conf confusion, things like that, straight to emergency department. Once they get clear from emergency department, it's like, yeah, this person has, you know, that has had a concussion. You know, it's going to feel a bit funny, dizzy, fatigue. They might change the mood. All the things, those are signs of concussion. They need to see a health professional qualified for concussion management to start the journey to prevent those symptoms from getting chronic. It can be treated, yes. It can be prevented, no. Can we prevent to make it, from making it worse? Yes, 100%. So we are really keen on getting this network happening. Um, this sideline course, there is a 45, yeah, I think we can get like um, code because we are already certifying this team. So I have to talk to the company's concussion management in Australia, see if they can give me code and I can give you that code so you can do the course for free. But I have to ask them because I don't have the code at the moment. But if you are interested, um, you can send me an email um, and I'm happy to give you that code. You do the sideline course and then you are already into this. That is very important for us to have you guys are the ones that are next to the patient every day. Uh, so for us, it's very important what you have to tell us and what you see on that patient. And you probably even notice changes in the performance on the way they're sleeping or the concentration at school. So that would be great if we can get that networking happening. So that's it for today. I hope it was clear. Um, have you got any questions at all, anyone? No? All right. Perfect. I hope it was clear enough. So my email is clara at wellness embodied cans. Dot com. If you have any questions, let me know. If you want me to do this at school or the club you work, I'm happy to do it as well. Um, have a great uh, evening and thank you for joining me.